subsidize a group of individuals, those who are unable to afford, right? So let's talk about how, how will we be classifying those who are vulnerable members? In Rwanda, we know they have such a strong local government. Everyone sits in a different socioeconomic background. And so you have what they call Ubudehe categories. And then the fourth Ubudehe category is the one that is fully subsidized. Those ones who, when they walk in, it's fully subsidized by the government. But as a country, right, considering you know, you've said 20% of the people are actively contributing and actively enrolled. Do we have the data? Do we have the, the force to be able to go and classify these people and make sure that nobody slips through the cracks? Dr. Liz. So thank you. Um, during the last census, uh, it was noted that uh, based on the tools that were used, the census tools, around 5.2 million households in Kenya are classified as poor. And uh, we approximate a household to have around four individuals. So we are talking about 20 million poor Kenyans. So based on that, and that's what actually we are targeting uh, for the social health insurance, the 5.2 million households uh, to gradually cover them. Uh, currently we have started with 1 million and we are hoping that by the end of uh, 2025, we should have covered all of the all of the 5.2 uh, million should at least be be on board so uh we work very closely with the ministry, uh, state department of social protection because they are the ones who uh, identify who who have the tools uh, to identify who is poor uh, in the country and this uh, to, uh, this uh, state department works closely also with the county governments they go house by house together with the chiefs uh, and the like to, because they're the ones who know the people of their community. And that's how we were able to identify those 1 million, uh, 1 million poor Kenyans. So this is an ongoing process. And we also know that poverty is not also a static state. You may be poor today, tomorrow you win a jackpot. You may be rich today, tomorrow you get uh, poor. So it's it becomes like something that you'll have to keep doing each and every year. And we know it's also resource intense, but since that is the commitment that we'll have to identify uh, these poor people, then uh, we have been going, uh, we, we have been doing that. And the fact that health is devolved, um, we left this out to the, we delegated that to the county government so that they also own their, their poor people so that they don't say that this is the list from Nairobi uh, of, of our poor people. So even at county level, they are in agreement. Once we get those lists, we submit them to NHIF. They validate that information. They find, and many, some other times they have even found that some of the people are even in, uh, maybe in employment and all those people have to, you know, are, are usually, you know, uh, removed or something like that. So there are a lot of validation steps before we narrow down to who are these um, uh, poor people. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I know we have a lot of tech in the room, so I'd like to even open up the conversation to the floor, right? In terms of enrollment, I know Safaricom might here. they are forever our success story in terms of giving financial access um, through M-Pesa. You go to any development class in any university, you'll hear about, um, you know, M-Pesa. So I know, um, Juliana, if we can get some of the mics going across the floor and we have other tech experts on the on the floor, what are some of your comments? What are some of your questions with regards to enrollment? What are some of the things you think we can be doing um, in terms of building the right tech infrastructure to help with processes like this so that you know we're not we're not burning fuel we're actually we're, we're helping build and drive efficiencies as well All right, good morning. Uh, thank you very much. Um, and thank you for inviting me for uh, this breakfast. Um, I think um, just to your point about access and uh, making that available. Um, my name is Juliana Rotich. I work for uh, Safaricom in financial services. Um, and um, before I mention that, I think just to uh, give a little bit of uh, context about us, and our role uh, in um, and our interest in uh, the topic of UHC uh, and also uh, a lot of the work that um, Zamara and 
uh, MOH and NHIF do. Um, we are a purpose-led uh, tech company. Uh, we're growing from a telco into a techco, um, and our purpose has and always has been around transforming lives. And uh, we believe in the uh, not only the potential, but also the actuality of technology in changing people's lives. And we, produ uh, we produce um, products, uh, we provide platforms, and we also have different marketplaces to help everyone uh, to, uh, build, uh, to build wealth and also to fully participate in the digital economy. Um, so when it comes to, uh, I think the, there was a very useful visual of the plane, and um, you've also mentioned the challenge around reaching uh, the informal sector which is over 80% uh, of, of Kenyans. Um, this is where Safaricom can help. And we have been helping. NHIF uh, was actually one of the first mini apps um, that uh, utilized the super app platform that we launched uh, in uh, 2020. Uh, it is still the most used, one of the most used uh, mini apps on that platform. Um, and it's an opportunity to continue to innovate around how we produce, how we pro provide financial services um, to the populace. Um, and um, our CEO, uh, Peter Dagwa, usually talks about three things, uh, partnership, innovation, and customer centricity. Um, so UHC, uh, Universal Healthcare, um, the path and that plane that was shown uh, to 20, 2030 is going to happen if we are all on board and our partners in taking off to, to get to that uh, reality. And that is something that uh, we are very committed to. Uh, and on the innovation side, uh, we're also very committed to extending the platforms and the marketplaces that we have, not only to uh, MOH and NHIF, uh, but also to Zamara and everybody else who's in the room who has a product and a platform that they would like to um, utilize uh, our reach. Um, we have more than 6 million downloads of the M-Pesa app, and uh, we M-Pesa um, has more than 30 million active uh, users of the M-Pesa platform. And we look at it this way. To reach the largest number of people around Kenya, you have to look at it with a mixed tech mentality, right? We have to not only capture those who use feature phones. Uh, some of us call it Kabambe. I think we still call it Kabambe, right? Or is that showing my age? <laughs> so, um, yeah, so feature phones like that, uh, we've got functionality um, that can reach them also, even as we innovate, we try not to forget, um, we actually do not forget uh, the folks who use feature phones. And then for those who are on smartphones, uh, we've provided the super app, like I mentioned, um, that not only has the NHIF app, but also has apps uh, for people that I see in the room. I see Michael uh, with Ponair Health. Um, they've utilized this platform to reach more and more people uh, in order to, to, uh, to uh, provide these services. So in short, innovation, partnership, and customer centricity. Okay. All right. Thank you. I don't know if, <laughs> I don't know if you can clap. <laughs> I don't know if, um, if there's any other kind of questions around when it comes to enrollment and making sure that we're, no one is slipping through the cracks, if we have any other questions in the audience. Okay, on this side. Oh, oh. Hi, mine is just a comment about uh, achieving acceleration. So my name is Flora Kangeda. I'm the Regional Director for Oracle Cloud Applications. So one of the things I'd like to recognize is what the government is doing in, in order to help us achieve. I know many times we don't spend time to appreciate sort of some of the steps that, are, that have been taken. If you look at the previous government, just looking at devolution, having the county, something that you, uh, Dr. Elizabeth alluded to, it, prov it makes sure that we can have reach. So that's part of the infrastructure that we have centers or communities or government representation to provide access to the people. Because at the end of the day, we are looking at the people. That is what we're trying to achieve. 
The other thing that the government has done very, very well is introduce a li different levels of hospitals. We can't take that for granted. That is also part of infrastructure. So when I look at it, the June 2023 is actually not unachievable. It's a journey that has already been started. The, the previous government also embedded it into law, and that gives us perspective, gives us direction, gives us guidance and understanding on what we want to achieve. So I just wanted to comment that the journey has already started and we need to continue to recognize that. With the new government coming in, they're not deviating from that, they are continuing to do that. And looking at acceleration, for example, for us in the digital world, even with the Safari comms, you need to continue to partner. I like what you said, partner and customer centricity. You need to continue to partner because digitization now helps you to accelerate, helps you to achieve what you want to achieve in the shortest time possible. If you remain manual, then obviously it will take you a lot longer. And I know um, NHIF, digitization has been something you're speaking about, something you've been, you've been uh, working on. And I would continue to to encourage you to continue to think in that way. There's no other way of acceleration other than digitization. Thank you. I will take the last comment over here. Oh, you have another one? There's more opportunities. We'll go on to the next section and you can find a way to plug in. Good morning. Uh, Francis is my name from uh, Sasa Doctor. Mine is um, the first one should be um, something that we should think about. We already have a system. We already have some of this data within the government. Uh, for instance, the APRS uh, system has all this information that can be utilized properly. If all these systems are interlinked, it can be interlinked with the NHIF, can be interlinked, um, I'm looking at even Safaricom, uh, where you are able to actually use this data and probably uh, have a, a one collection point eventually. Maybe uh, as we're thinking, uh, some of us have really thought about using the tax uh, that is scary, for instance, to collect instead of NHIF collecting. But is there a plan to have all these systems integrated? I know uh, I've heard from Safaricom, they, they, they would want to have all these systems integrated, talk to each other, and eventually be able to get this information out there. That's the first one. And then the second one is about um, the fragmentation of uh, uh, the health systems or health categories. So we look at uh, there is tertiary healthcare, there is primary healthcare, there is secondary healthcare. All these levels are different. In terms of achieving UHC, we have to start with the basic one. We have to start with the primary healthcare. Can we first concentrate on trying to get the basic level, a basic level of uh, uh, universal health coverage, which is basically primary health care to everyone, regardless of their uh, social status. Thanks. Okay. Um, thank you very much uh, for your comments and those questions. So let's talk about, we'll talk about systems and even go more into a couple of questions around systems um, and then defragmentation of healthcare. So in, com in terms of systems, maybe Wambugu, you can take the question from an NHF point of view. What are the plans in terms of interlinking systems? We have a lot of data that has been collected by different entities. How do we make sure that when health management um, information systems are being built in a very robust manner um, and patient, you know, patient medical records are looking, um, you know, consolidated. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and is actually, actually what you're saying is very correct. Uh, and I think even what Flora said about uh, digitization and actually the, the issue of digital transformation is one of the ideas that NHF has really been focusing on. And of course, a future RGS here and there, we have not been able to actually to reach to the level where we may want to be. I know we have had a lot of engagements with Oracle, Safaricom, we have had quite a, quite a number of discussions, but you're on that route. Now, in terms of integrating with the government systems, uh, we are already actually already integrated with the IPRS, where, and that is why now a member goes to, if you go to register now, you can actually register as you sit there through the, the mobile or through online. And the, the, the system is able to link with IPRS and actually confirm the details once you enter your ID. And actually that has been the desire even when it comes to the issue of uh, declaration of the dependents, declaration of the spouses, 
um, even when it comes to registration of employers and such. Unfortunately, some of those government systems or some of those government bodies or departments are not fully digitized. For example, when you come to the register of births, register of marriages, register of, of, of um, companies and others. So you realize that nowadays, if now if you want to register your spouse, you have to come to NHL with a copy of your marriage certificate, a copy of ID. If you want to register your children, the same case of uh, the same style. However, we have actually been in discussions with the government on how we can actually be able to integrate all those systems so that when you come to NHL, when you go online, or through your mobile and you want to declare your dependent, the systems are actually able to do the confirmation. In the new law that was amended, the NHF Act that was amended and was assented by the president this year, it actually recommends that they be established what we are calling the centralized healthcare provider management system. And the centralized healthcare provider management system, besides linking the healthcare systems across the country, across of the facilities in the network of the NHIF or in the panel of NHIF, it will also link all those other um, bodies or departments or systems in the country that are dealing with the population data so that it will be a one-stop one shop whenever you want to register when you confirm any details in regard to your treatment where you can need you need to access care it will be a one-stop shop that journey has already started of course the directive of the president when he launched you see in the beginning of the year was that that should be in place by june but of course when the team sat down they actually realized it's something that requires quite a heavy financial uh, um, allocation. So it's a journey we are moving on. Right now, we are actually working on towards integrating what NHF already has as our system and what the ministry has, what they call the DHIS, so that then the two systems can be able to read to each other. I've already talked about the IPRS and then the discussions and going how we integrate slowly. Before we can get to that level, now we are saying we have a fully centralized healthcare provider management system, also linking with all those other government systems. Yes. Thank okay. You. Thank you very much for that. That's good to know. I know we have a lot of health tech people doing a, a lot of things around um, patient records in the room as well. So when we talk about health management, you can take a kind of passive approach where me as a patient, it's not my business, but my health is not my business. Yeah, it's my job is to go to hospital, get treated and leave, right? I don't have my own medical records. It's between the doctors and the government are the ones who know when I went to hospital, when I was treated and things like that. Um, Dr. Liz, I know you talked about, you know, healthy living being a focus and the patients being at the center of their patient care, right? So how do you think technology can help kind of shift this culture and make sure that, you know, we have patients at the center of their own patient care? Um, and does the government have any plans to kind of make that at the forefront of achieving UHC? Okay, so um, thank you for that. Um, in terms of uh, patient-centeredness, uh, we know that there have been quite a number of, for example, apps, especially for, say, the pregnant women, um, reminding them that, uh, you know, you are due for your clinic and even for the children. There have been some of these immunization apps just reminding the parents that um, probably that the child is due for their, their vaccine, uh, for the immunization. So in terms of that, um, they, they are not, uh, these have been, uh, you know, uh, initiatives uh, here and there, not... Uh, like fully, I would, I would, I would not say really government driven, but um, government supported. So, in terms of um, taking charge of the health of, of people's health, it's it, the same approach could uh, could be applied. Um, Many a times we don't even do our annual checkup. Say if someone turns 40, they should probably be through technology, get some of these messages saying that you are now due, you are now 40, you are due for this uh, screening test. If you are a, a man, maybe you have a prostate scan. If you are a woman, you're told, okay, yes, you have this. And probably even from your previous results, uh, if follow up, uh, let's say you have done a, a um, pap smear, for example, and uh, maybe the results are uh, and not so, you know, depending on the results, you may need to do probably one after a year or another year. So technology can come into place here because we are busy people. Um, sometimes also you need that nudge for you to know that, oh, I'm actually due for this. Even just simple things as dental checkups. Many, many times we don't, we only go to the dentist when we have a cavity or we need uh, something fixed. but 
we could also just go for a dental, you know, dental checkup. And that's what I talk about taking charge, uh, taking charge of your health. So this is an approach I'm seeing where technology can be used to really make people, keep people in charge of their health. The other thing I would, I'd want to say, um, that is for prevention, but even for patient care, uh, many times, uh, I'm not sure about the private sector, whether they have apps where a patient can log in and see their records, see what the doctor, if the doctor has seen you, you see what notes the doctor took about you, what their recommendations are, even when your results come come from the lab, I know this doesn't happen in the in the public sector, uh, but probably it could be happening in one or two facilities. But I should be able to just log into my account and see that uh, once a, a test has been done, I'm able to see my results. They are my results, and that's what uh, data actually the Data Protection Act is all about. That information about you is yours. It should you shouldn't be hidden from. Uh, information about you shouldn't be hidden from you. You should be knowing what's happening. So uh, these are avenues I'm seeing where, um, you know, as a private sector, you can be our first runners up, you know, then uh, of course, this can also be uh, adopted uh, even in the public sector. Yeah. Um, before I get, I know there's some companies on the floor that are very much have invested a lot of time and technology into doing this, but I just want to dig a little deeper into what you've talked about in terms of understanding medical histories and things and going into now treatment protocols and managing the cost of care by standardizing treatment protocols, right? We see that, you know, someone goes to one hospital, they do one test, like, you know, whether you're, you're checking, even if it's for... Um, checking your hemoglobin, right? So you do one test, you're referred somewhere else, someone will do the same test, you're referred somewhere else, someone will do the same test for the same case of sickness, right? So in terms of, you know, standardizing treatment protocols to make the cost of care more effective, from an, you know, an NHF point of view, how are you managing those processes and those processes of like, what medications are people getting? They're not being over-medicated or over-tested um, because we know that has been a challenge in the past. So how can we make sure that, you know, spending is more efficient with regards to that? Thank you. Um, I think that ties even to what I said earlier in terms of a centralized healthcare provider management system. Uh, because you look at the countries that are ahead in terms of, um, uh, even UAC, uh, and I know Kenya has been studying a lot actually the Thailand model in terms of how they have implemented UAC and Thailand is quite ahead of Kenya. You find that they have that kind of system. A central healthcare provider management system such that if I visit hospital A, maybe a level one, or I mean a level two or three, where maybe I'm receiving the basic care, the primary healthcare, somebody insinuated, and then I'm going maybe to a level higher level, maybe I've been referred. Uh, my records can, only, uh, can already be accessed from the same level. So that is already now taken care of in the law, that there will be that centralized system so that from my, the, the history of my healthcare provision can actually be viewed at the same point. However, of course, I know that one will come with a lot of trust, even among the healthcare provider themselves, because I'm sure you have experienced this when you go to hospital A and you do a test. When you go to hospital B, even if you have your result, they insist on doing theirs. But I'm, I'm sure they are, the Ministry of Health will have to come in so that once the, the, the protocols are defined and everything is put in place, and once a test has been done in this hospital, there's no way a hospital B again can request the same procedures to be repeated. Because as you put it, it is very costly that I have to do an MRI here. And then when I go to another hospital, they insist on doing another MRI, yet I already have the results, meaning that maybe they don't trust the test that was done in the hospital A, and that's why they have to do their own. And eventually it becomes very costly, both for the individual, if at all maybe they could be meeting it out of their pocket, and also for the health insurance, because then you find that you have to pay a lot for the same process that you could have avoided. So that one is already uh, taken care of in the law. And once the system is in place, definitely we'll actually be able to have all those, everything defined in terms of the protocols, and it will be very easy for healthcare providers and even the professionals in terms of seeing the history, and maybe even for the individuals, as uh, Dr. Lee said, an individual being able to access their history of care and maybe it informs them even in terms of what they need to do to take care of their health. Okay. Yeah. Um, thank you very much. Now I'd like to just open the floor to the mic. So any terms of, in terms of when it comes to patient records and health tech, if we can get the mic on the floor. Yeah.
Great, thanks. I think uh, I'm uh, the CEO at Ponea Health. And just a few observations and maybe questions. Um, I think I've got a colorful history with the Ministry of Health in terms of trying to do automation. And it just didn't, didn't naturally end very well. Not because the vision was, was flawed in any way. I think the resistance to change is big. So the first question is, it's great to have conversations like this. But we have big meetings of 250 people in workshops, in Ivasha, blah, blah, blah. Project is well funded. But the conversation remains, even after doing the enterprise architecture and saying we're going to implement this, it's a great conversation in the room, but behind the room, people do not really want the project to take off. So how do you address this resistance to change? Knowing very well that's the elephant in the room. Technology, I think, whether or not you talk about patient centricity in terms of records, blah, 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 medical uh, medical drug uh, drug and trace progr uh, pro programs all the way from manufacturer imports to patient. These are all things we know, right? But I think the biggest challenge is commitment to that change. Now, I highly doubt a project of this nature will ever take off, and at least from experience, and I've been burnt on this, a lot of money, right? I don't think a project like this will take off unless you have top leadership commitment. I think if the president of a country does not commit to say that we want to digitize, I think we're all wasting time. That's my personal opinion. It has to be at the point of where, like our, what is this highway? What is this SGR stuff we built? We have SGR, right? So they had the highest level of commitment in the country to make sure that SGR is implemented was there. He himself would go and see the project. When we build the expressway, he himself would go and see the project. So unless we have that level of commitment at that presidential level, I think this is going to remain a story. That's my two cents. And an investor in this business, <laughs> significant, right? All right. Then my next conversation as we move on is now let's look at patient-centric care. I think when you look at insurance companies, they most of them are most likely building, most of them are building technology towards ensuring patients don't claim. I'm sorry if there's an insurance company here. And number two, to make sure there is no fraud, right? When you go to a big healthcare facility, like my friend Gelot here, he'll tell you part of my biggest investment in when I was building healthcare centers was the issue of making sure that my employees don't steal from me. So most of them were made to ensure there's no fraud within the organizations, right? Whether the, my pharmacists are not stealing from me, my lab techs are not stealing from me. So all of them were made for internal issues in terms of governance. If you then go to, to pharmacies, the same question. If you go to government, it's not about cost, it's about access. But then there's nobody building systems for the patient. Everybody's building for themselves, but there is really no conversation around the patient. So now, for instance, we go and build, yes, yeah, somebody talked about equipment. Yes, we put up, how, how much was it? Half a billion dollars worth of equipment across the country. So I'm in the middle of Vihiga, right? Or Thika. Maybe I'm not, I don't come from Vihiga for all I know, but in the middle of, of Vihiga. And I, and I have, I sprained my ankle and I want to know where to get an MRI at the right price point. Tell me, well, how, would I, how would I get to know which MRI, which hospital, which hospital takes NHIF, how much I need to pay for it? If you call a hospital, Vihiga hospital, country hospital, you ask them for an MRI, they'll tell you, give me the price, they'll tell you I don't know. And yet you have to commute 40 kilometers to Vihiga, to the Vihiga, whatever center it is, right? So the question is, nobody's building systems with the patient at the heart of it. Everybody's building to cover themselves, but not, not the patient at the center of the conversation. So the question is, who really, who are we trying to serve? Is it the patient? Is it ourselves? All right. Thank you very much, Michael. I think we have a question on this side and then we can go over them. Uh, morning. My name is Silvio Gola. I'm a lawyer, compliance manager at Afia Record. We build tech solutions using blockchain technology that are focused on patient centricity and allowing patients to have control and autonomy over their health records. I think the biggest challenge that um, even my good friend has mentioned from Panea is unless there's a push from the government, so mine is more of a comment and you know, question also to MOH and NHF in terms of what's being done around, around the law and regulation on um, health records and data privacy and data sharing. Unless there's a push from the government, what you'll find is for a lot of private sector players, um, there's a commercial reason as to why they don't want this data and information shared 
if the data stays at Aga Khan or at whichever hospital, the patients have to stay there. And yet the patient is the only person in the entire ecosystem that moves around. You don't find the insurance companies or the hospitals moving. It's the patient who moves. So I think there needs to be a big push as well from the MOH um, to also engage the government, the Office of the Data Commissioner around laws that mandate and help private sector players know how should data and healthcare information be shared because there's a sensitive nature towards it. Um, there's need for manipulation in terms of, you know, if it's not shared in, in the right hands. But I think the biggest challenge that you find is a lot of these private sector players don't want to intershare information. And if we're talking about universal healthcare coverage, I shouldn't have to, as you say, repeat the same MRI at four different hospitals. Um, I don't think, you know, all my healthcare records, when I think about it today, are spread across many different hospitals. And even if I go there to ask for this information, despite the fact that it is my constitutional right to this information, I have to pay some of these hospitals thousands of shillings to request for my doctor's notes, to request for my lab results. Um, so I think there really needs to be a push from the Ministry of Health from NHIF to engage the government around what laws, what regulations that are also sector specific, because insurance to medical care is quite different. We, we may look at it as healthcare, but the laws and you know the way this, the rules of engagement work are quite different. But I think without that, um, you know, one of the biggest challenges we find trying to bring, build technology that allow market players to be able to talk, to share this information around their patients is if we don't have that mandatory push from the government, people won't do it. Uh, and private sector players will continue focusing on the bottom line and not the patient. And yet we're here to all talk about UHC. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'll go to the question of how, how to address resistance to change. Um, Wambugu, you've been at NHIF for a long time. Dr. Liz, you're here to make sure that from an MND perspective, we get where we need to go. So Dr. Liz, maybe you can start us off with that. Um, and comment also on the patient care side. Yeah, so thank you. Um, uh, last year's, uh, uh, let me just say the last government was really committed to attainment of UHC. And uh, part of the things that were, um, uh, that were in place is the role of other sectors. If you look at uh, the UHC roadmap, we acknowledge that we cannot achieve UHC on our own as the Ministry of Health. We have to involve the other sectors. You have the, you know, involve the Ministry of Roads to ensure the roads are, you know, the facilities are accessible, Ministry of Energy to ensure there's electricity, water, and ICT. And right now, as we speak, there is what we call, the Ministry is de developing what we call a digital health platform. Yeah. Uh, so I think, uh, um, we have high level commitment. If you look at the current government's manifesto, it's big on digital digitization of health. And us as the Ministry of Health, our role is to actualize that manifesto because uh, it's, it's in our interest that uh, that manifesto comes to life. So as it is right now, we are having, we have developed um, a system that uh, will collect patient level data and uh, part of the barriers that were there were also uh, legislative uh, because, you know, you, for you to have patient level data, a lot of issues of data security had to come into place. But now with the data, as I, as I mentioned, the Data Protection Act is there. And we are, I know the issue of unique, the unique identifier has been there also for a long time, but right now it's at advanced stages. But for sure, um, as we speak, we, are, we have uh, piloted the digital health platform in around nine facilities. And the whole point will be to gradually expand. You, you realize that it's also not cheap. You can develop a system, but then you also need the hardware. You need the computers. Uh, right now we have 10,000 facilities, private and public in this country. So you can imagine all those facilities need computers, they need electricity, they need the network. Uh, and the staff need to know how to operate these things. You'd be surprised that if you go to the county facilities, uh, in the rural facilities, people don't even know how to put on a computer. So you're just not talking about the infrastructure, you're even talking about capacity building. So some of these things can have to be done, you know, quite gradually. And, and 
And also one thing that also happened uh, because of UHC is the development of the partnership framework that also has a strong emphasis on public and private. Uh, we say these days collaboration, not uh, partnership. So uh, in situations where uh, we need say the private sector, um, the tech people, you know, uh, of course they'll come into, you know, they they'll, we'll see how we can, you know, work together, the government and also the private sector to make this a reality. Otherwise, uh, it's something that uh, there's a strong uh, political uh, goodwill uh, right from the previous government to the current government. I, you, I can assure you, if you have read the manifesto, it's there in the manifesto. So we have the backing from the highest level in the country. Okay. All right. Um, thank you very much uh, for that for that uh, statement of commitment. Um, I think we've had it here. It will we'll hear it in the news. <laughs> um, but yeah, and as we said, if we, with committed leadership is how we get to these places, right? I think something that does help is the global pressure towards achieving UHC. Um, you know, Kenya usually in, on the continent tends to be, you know, the a part of driving a lot of these initiatives or being a thought leader in this space. I think Rwanda have overtaken us with kind of their commitment. But generally, from a global perspective, I think there's usually a lot of pressure on Kenya to do things so that uh, the neighbors can also also do things in, in a similar regard, right? Um, so yeah, so let's go into a couple of other questions with regards to cost, right? We'll, let's talk about you know inflation when it comes to medication and medical tech, right? We have a high reliance on importation of medication and medical technology. Um, you know, what role you know do we feel there is to play in terms of local manufacturing in terms of helping manage the cost of care with that regard? I'd hand over to you. Um, one okay, thank you. I felt like that one is for for Minister of Health than myself. But it's okay. but maybe even before I get to your question, maybe I still wanted to add something on what somebody had raised about the government commitment in yes. terms of attainment of UAC. And actually, we can be able to assure us that the government is actually fully committed. And some of the strides we have actually made, even in terms of the legal reform that required to be done, so that then we can actually be able to show that actually UAC is anchored on the law, is because of the government commitment from the executive to the even to the legislature. We have had actually, or I would almost say, a smooth sail in terms of uh, going through the legal reforms. And you have seen even in the previous government the kind of declarations and the, 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 the participation of the previous government in terms of UEC, the pilot uh, coming up with a panel that made varied recommendations that actually on implementation, actually now we can talk of 60% implementation up to the level of launching the UEC and a lot of many other efforts. The current government, again, you have seen their commitment. Actually, I remember even when the new government was sworn in, among the institutions that were actually engaged within the first two weeks, of the government being placed was actually NHIF and the Ministry of Health in terms of updating the government or appraising the government on how far we have gone to UEC, and they have actually been able to assure uh, full support to the actual agenda of UEC. So there's actually full commitment, and that is actually makes us convinced that we should actually be able to achieve UEC before 2030. The question we had asked earlier, we should actually be able to get there before the year 2030. Now, going to your question in terms of uh, dealing with issues like of medical inflation, inflation uh, ensuring that actually we be able to reduce the cost by having local manufacturing of the pharmaceuticals. Of course, this is a discussion that has been there for a while. Um, and, and we have seen um, even sometimes, even on the media, some partnership that NHF has been able to, uh, to get into with some of the, these pharmaceutical companies so that they can be able to have, we can actually be able to bring the cost of healthcare down and affordable. Uh, we had, we, we're already having a partnership in terms of the, bre um, the, the drug for breast cancer. Uh, oncology and other areas, I think also prostrate. So we are actually working with development partners in what we are calling the, the private, public private partnerships to see how we can be able either, even if it is not local manufacturing, but even if it is, it, we are, it is a proper, um, it is uh, importation, then it is actually at very subsidized rates so that actually the cost of treatment, like when it comes to oncology and um, uh, renal dialysis, then the cost is actually reduced to a great extent so that we're actually able to deal or actually to, 
to maintain the cost law as much as we know the medical inflation is rising at a very high rate more than maybe even the the, the normal in inflation is is rising at it's a big challenge and it is making actually the cost of healthcare care to go very high but i know the kind of approaches and the partnerships we're engaging in to a, to a great extent we'll be able to put that in control okay yeah thank you very much for that i don't know if you had anything to add on the same no i think uh... I think he has touched on that, uh, but we also know there is the what you call Buy Kenya, Build Kenya, uh, which has been an initiative of the government for some time, where we really encourage a lot of you know use of local, local, um, you know locally manufactured uh, commodities, and that will also uh, apply to more or less the health uh, health products. So. Um, together with what he said, uh, there's also a strong commitment on local manufacturing still captured in the manifesto. And we are really, uh, as it is, we, we even have an institution, BioVax, uh, where we'll, uh, we will be setting up. It's, the plan is for it to manufacture the vaccines, but uh, that is just the first step. Otherwise, uh, uh, there is a commitment to also do local manufacturing for both uh, medicines and even the supplies, the boxes, yeah. you know, the packaging. Those are things that can be done uh, in country. Because when you when you look at uh, manufacturing, people tend to want to look at the unit costs of the, the commodity, but you don't look at the greater economy uh, of things. Because uh, if you are locally manufacturing, there are people employed, they are bringing back to the community, those people are paying taxes, the companies are paying tax, corporate mm -hmm. taxes. So that, uh, if you look at it just at that, as that unit cost, it tends to, it, it may tend to seem expensive, but in the bigger picture of things, it is actually uh, quite cheaper to the economy, greater yeah. economy. Okay. Maybe yes. you could allow, just wanted to add one thing that besides, of course, even in, in terms of man, uh, manufacturing, local manufacturing of drugs, I would say the government is also doing a lot even in terms of ensuring that some of the technology that are, could actually be making Kenyans to seek out of the country. Mm -hmm. For example, you have seen a lot happening through KU, K K Kenyatta, uh, Kenyatta University Teaching Referral and Research Hospital. We have some technology now that are available in KU that would actually were not available have not been available in kenya previously such that some of the conditions that would require kenyans to go abroad for treatment then kenyans are able to, to access that care just a few years ago we actually were able to have kenyans now accessing pet scan locally pet scan about three years ago kenyans had to go up, out of the country for pet scan and it would cost a single patient it would cost about two hundred thousand shillings yeah. currently now we are doing it locally at a cost of about less than seventy thousand kenya shillings so there's a lot of actually being done, ensuring that the capacity of the facilities locally is built. And that is why currently, even for you to go for care out of the country, you actually require the government approval if you are actually going to be covered at the government uh, health insurance like NHIF to actually confirm that that procedure is not available locally because the government wants to build the capacity of the local facilities more to reduce the cost of health care than having Kenyans going abroad for health care. Okay. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Yes. And as you know, we build capacity locally as, you know, doctors become more trained as we get more medical technology. It will require less referrals, out of country referrals. And also it's an opportunity to offer services to those across borders who might have um, lower levels of infrastructure than ourselves. We just want to cover a couple more questions. I know the insurers in the room are usually concerned that they'll be out of business because of UHC. Um, they're looking at their 50 billion of premium and they're seeing NHF will take all of it. Um, um, so let's talk a bit about, you know, kind of what is the role private health insurance will play from a risk layering point of view, you know, in most jurisdictions, we say the national insurer will cover the kind of the first layer of risk in terms of primary, primary care. And then you have these others that come for tertiary items, benefits that are not usually covered in the essential benefit package, or when it comes to the, the co-payment, if there's any co-payment required in the, in the benefit structure, then usually private insurers might also cover that cost. What role will private insurers play in this ecosystem of UHC and particularly when you talk about even on the informal sector side, right? We know some have invested in the micro insurance side. Is there still kind of growth opportunity for them um, to offer complementary services? Thank you. Um... UHC as uh, is being uh, implemented in Kenya now. Of course, uh, we saw from the presentation that James made earlier. UHC looks at the four components of population coverage, the services coverage, and the cost coverage. 
At this uh, uh, point, we are here as a country on implementation of VC. I know we are focusing more, maybe first of all, on the population coverage to ensure that every Kenyan is at an umbrella of, uh, of health insurance such that they can actually, they don't have to use, uh, to incur out of pocket expenditure every time they are seeking care, especially the basic care. And Chef currently is covering about 10 benefits. Um, and, and to a great extent, uh, those are the services that Kenyans may need. But we know that even within those services that NHF is currently covering under UEC, for example, oncology, when it comes to something like basic chemotherapy, we are covering about six sessions per year. The same case with complex chemotherapy, uh, radiotherapy, also covering a limited uh, number of sessions because, again, the kind of revenue base we have can only allow us to be able to cover to a, to a great extent. And that is why you realize that, again, I still go back to the amended law because it has actually attempted to take care of all those things. It creates a provision that as much as any chef will be able, or through UAC, Kenyans will be able to access most of the healthcare they need, there is still a role for the healthcare, I mean, for the private health insurances, health will be able to come in and as from what you have said, be able to cover from the limit now that any chef cannot be able to cover. If we are covering renal dialysis for only two sessions per week, the third and the fourth session that the Kenyan may need, they may need to have a complementary health, private health insurance to be able to cover that. And of course, even the 10 benefits we are covering, we are not covering all the benefits that a Kenyan may need to access for their health uh, for their healthcare needs. So the private health insurances again have to come in and be able to bridge that gap. Now, in the act, you also realize in section 30, I've also said that even in the count to the issue of, uh, because now it requires the employers to match contributions, for every employee. However, it has created a provision that if a private company can actually be able to get a private health insurance for the employees, then they're actually exempted from matching contributions to NHF. So it kind of, it has really left a lot for the private health insurances to cover because I'm sure many employers and many employees may actually maybe to prefer to have a private health insurance cover uh, so that they are not putting all their eggs in one basket, NHF and NHF alone. So they may want to pay their contribution to NHF for statutory, but whatever, then anything else over and above what NHF cannot cover, other than, again, having it covered by NHF, it is covered by the private health insurances. So there's a lot of working together. Of course, maybe we should go towards co-creating products such that a Kenyan will be buying a product and they're sure once I buy this, then I'm sure I'm taking care of both from the private health insurance side and also from the national health insurance side. Okay. Yeah. Great. Thank you very much. I don't know if there are insurers in the room who have any additional questions with regards to to that. Any? Any? Yes. Um. Yeah. Thank you. I'm Wesley Tor uh, from AR Insurance. Um, maybe just a key point for me is um, just around regulation, especially the aspect of cost. Um, I think that is an honest opinion that we need to actually have uh, with a number of stakeholders um, from the medical side uh, all the way now to the insurance. As, as much as we focus on uh, UHC, the focus should be um, bringing in coherence between the private sector and of course now say the NHI. Uh, what we've seen a lot is, is, is um, a point in which probably the prices around the medical and all that, the medical inflation aspect is actually driving the insurance out of, out of market. Um, that is much driven by the aspect of no regulation um, really that guides around pricing of medical aspect and all that. So you find you go to the hospital, for instance, the aspect of COVID. Uh, we saw a lot of increase in prices that we're not able to actually explain from an insurance perspective. Um, in, in, in a way, it only tells us that there's no really so much government intervention around prices that we are actually getting from, from the hospital and all that. So it's, it's a very good, um, probably the proposal would be for us to actually have the government even regulate the medical uh, pricing aspect. Of course, I understand the aspect, the parameters that goes, that goes in into the pricing and all that. Um, all that should actually be taken care of. But of course, there should be the base rates in which um, the medical um, uh, uh, fraternity are able to operate from. 
Um, something else would be for us to really uh, see what, um, of course, so the pricing aspect and of course, now giving a chance for the private insurers to actually create uh, products which are affordable for the masses. In such a case, then it implies the government need to really come into play and, and provide like the base rates of, of what kind of cover are they able to actually provide. Uh, of course, the regulation around the UA, uh, that came with the NHIF to, to say that the private insurers pay the first, the first, uh, the first uh, um, cost and then maybe now the NHIF comes in to pay uh, at, at last. Of course, that's also an implication to the private insurer. And, and, and of course, with that, um, it, it's only saying um, we probably have to review the premiums. And in such a case, it, it also reduces, and, and, and like you said, um, a number of people would actually tend to, and, and especially the airlines, or the affluence would actually tend to actually get the private insurance rather than the NHIF, especially if they get to into an hospital. So, so it's it's much about the coherence and, and trying to strike um, what are the optimum points in which the two are actually able to uh, to operate. Um, okay, thank you. Maybe. Um... Maybe even to comment on the issue that you mentioned about the, the private insurances being able to pay for that's uh, the amendment section 22 of the amended act. Um, yeah, it created that provision. And actually, it's not really to say that the, the private insurances will come in and pay first, but uh, there is the what we can call the essential healthcare or benefit package that an insurer will always come in and pay first. And then any other remaining part of the bill then is now what the private insurance is care of. Now, immediately we enhanced our benefit package in 2015. Uh, how, how it was being done is that uh, uh, have introduced other benefits beyond what can be termed as uh, essential uh, healthcare benefit packages. And even with those healthcare benefit packages, like when it comes to the thing like the major surgeries, the specialized surgeries, where and she have actually been able to negotiate with healthcare providers to provide it comprehensively, then uh, at that particular point, and she was still coming in and being able to take maybe the biggest portion or all, all in some instances, depending on the healthcare provider they have sought. So the, the current amended law now tells us to put some balance into that, that as much as now we are offering beyond the basic healthcare package, when it comes now to those advanced benefit package, there should be a way of sharing it with the private insurances where somebody is insured with the private insurances to avoid scenarios where NHF is taking 90% of the burden, yet they have taken maybe 10% of the premium. Because if you compare the NHF premium and what somebody pays to the private or the insurance, it's actually the difference is quite big. So that is the balance it has tended to strike. And that is where you realize that even at the point in which now the current law is being put in place, there was a lot of engagement with the private health insurance providers to ensure that actually we're able to get into a consensus and agreement how this is going to work for them and is not going to drive them out of market. Now, I agree on what uh, the, 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 the gentleman has said in regard to cost of healthcare. It's actually not only affecting the private health insurance, but even to the biggest extent in NH NHIF. Because you realize that for the private health insurances, if the cost goes high, you can be able to see today in your boardroom and judge the premiums and it is, and it is done. But it comes to NHIF is a process. You realize that we have not been able to adjust our premiums for a very long time. Why? It is a process that requires approval by the government, the legislature, the public participation that has to be done before Kenyans can say you can increase the informal sector contribution from 500 per month to maybe 700 shillings per month. So it becomes a very big challenge in terms of still being able to assure Kenyans, at, at a, a special country with UAC, that an insurance will be able to cover you comprehensively without you incurring expenditure with the high rising cost of expenditure in terms of the HPTs, the health products and technologies, the consultation that we are getting, even the, from the figures we get from the Kenya Medical Practitioners and Density Council. So it's a big challenge that Kenyans need to sit down. And of course, I know that it has a big role with the government, which we are part of, but a big responsibility to the Ministry of Health to actually regulate the cost of healthcare in the country so that even insurances can be able to still maintain their premiums to an affordable rate when allow many Kenyans to enroll for health insurance, either health, uh, national health insurance or even the private health insurance, because we need all players to be there because we don't want a place where we have a monopoly 
and then the quality is likely to, to, to become lower. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. I'll ask Dr. Liz, you can give some closing remarks at Wambugo, um, conscious of time. Then we have um, Nico will come and give us the vote of thanks. Okay, so thank you. Before I close, I, 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 I needed to make a comment still on the cost. Uh, the Ministry of Health is currently doing what you call cost of services, costing services. So that if, for example, um, if you're asked what is the cost of a cesarean section, you know, what you know, we look at the inputs and basically the services and be able to guide and say that based on this is a document that will cost each and every service offered uh, in the health sector. That's number one. Number two, um, and these are still part of the foundational things that have been done because of UHC. Uh, number two, we have been also doing the, what you call medicine and pricing. So when you're looking at the pricing of the medicines, uh, there'll be a document that will actually give the standardized, like a standardized um, uh, pricing. Uh, that, of course, that will be together still with the formulary. So that this uh, pricing uh, will feed into the costing of the services. And of course, we are developing also clinical guidelines that will also, uh, you know, uh, guide on really how to manage, you know, the various conditions. So some of these things are, more or less like foundational documents or foundational um, processes that have been there in the last two, three years uh, as part of UHC, uh, which maybe are not visible outside, but you realize that for you to achieve that, then you have to do some of the, you know, these foundational works. So uh, over to my remarks. Uh, for me, I would want to thank um, Zamara and the entire team here for inviting us. Uh, to share with you on the vision of the government. Uh, I know everyone likes saying the government, this, the government, that, but I can assure you that um, we are very committed. Uh, the current cabinet secretary is quite committed to um, putting UHC at a pedestal. And even as you've seen, as I've mentioned even before, the manifesto really emphasizes on, uh, on a lot about UHC. And it's us to push it because we are the ministry that is meant to implement that section. So it, we can't say that we don't have the political goodwill. We have the political goodwill. Uh, and as I said also before, there's a very strong uh, role the private sector plays and not just the private hospitals, the pri private sector in general. We have worked quite closely with, with KEPSA before and we know that they have a big role to play in the uh, entire health sector space. And um, I believe that uh, with you know this collaboration, we should be able to achieve um, uh, UHC before 2030. Thank you. Thank you. And as well. uh, thank you so much uh, for this time to be able actually to come together and actually just share how we are on the journey to UEC. One thing I want to assure us, and actually the Kenyans, is that we are on the journey to UEC and we are going to attain UEC as a country. There's a lot of commitment and there's a lot that has been done. A major one being actually aligning the legal framework because we could have done a lot, but if the legal framework is not right, and we know the way Kenyans are keen, then we could have had to actually face a lot of challenges. The government committed is, you cannot doubt that. We have seen it. We can be able to demonstrate that. We know there's a lot to be done, especially in terms of infrastructure. The biggest infrastructure for health in the country is government. She mentioned about 10,000 facilities countrywide, and actually 80% of them are actually in the initial panel. Uh, and out of that 80%, over 75% of them are government healthcare providers. But now when you look in terms of access, you find so many Kenyans preferring to go to the private healthcare providers. I'm sure even all of us who are seated in this room, if you are to fall sick now, I'm not sure you are going to rush to Bagadi or to Kenyatta. You are going to be finding your way to Aga Khan, to Nairobi Hospital, to Mpisha. We know the reason why. So we have to work together on that at the private players, at the government to ensure that we are taking the level of healthcare in the government providers to the level that a Kenyan should be thinking of a government healthcare provider. And why am I saying that? That does not mean that we don't want Kenyans or the private pro providers to, to actually still continue doing business. We just talked of statistics of having about 20 million Kenyans being poor and vulnerable. Those private Kenyans, I mean, those Kenyans do not be able to afford healthcare in the high ed facilities. They are the ones who will be able to assess in the basic facilities being the government facilities. So we need to have the government healthcare infrastructure work 
And I know you'll be able to achieve that through partnership, through collaborations. And so once we do that, Kenyans can comfortably be able to say they can visit to a hospital, receive care, not in capital or out of pocket expenditure, and you'll be able to get to the level of UC. Lastly, is the issue of medical fraud. I thought we were going to touch on that in this discussion. It's a major issue in Kenya. I'm sure the private health care, uh, private health insurance is experiencing that. The issue of medical fraud, actually it's a problem globally, not just in Kenya, but maybe in Kenya it's a lot. At NHF we feel it a lot because, again, because of our spread of our many providers, of our many members, and maybe lacking the adequate uh, number of personnel and even the adequate infrastructure to be able to bring it to the level that now it does not really lead to very high financial hemorrhage. So we need to work on that again together, private partners, we work together with the National Health Insurer so that we can actually be able to control medical fraud because that is another reason why the cost of Medicare in the country is going very high and making it affo unaffordable for many Kenyans. If we are able to control that, you can actually be able to actually see quite some reduction in cost because now we have to take care of that even as we price our products because it's something that is to another level in this country. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you very much. I'd like to thank you very much for your time. Um, we've talked a, a lot about, you know, the role technology can play, you know, focusing on primary health care to improve, you know, the level of access. Um, you know, the question of whether the money is enough uh, is always, there's never enough money. I think when we look at health systems across the world, there's never enough money. All of them are always saying they're spending 90%, 100%, 120%. Um, the question is about with the funds that we have, how are we mobilizing them to improve? improve health outcomes and health gains, and the stakeholders in the room, the stakeholders who are tuning in virtually, um, and yourselves, hopefully we can partner together towards achieving universal health coverage. Um, and then hopefully the aim is in May next year, we're trying to see if we can have a social security conference, get partners from across Africa, because we've seen a lot of the same challenges. We want to make sure that even as we're thinking of more Pan-African um, visions, even as a as a jurisdiction that we can feed into that conversation, um, help gather information and share knowledge that we have learned in the process as we gather next year in May. So I'd like to invite James to give our panelists a small token, <laughs> just a token of appreciation as also Nikhil comes for the vote of thanks. It's coming over there. Thank you, James. Thank you, Samantha. Uh, as I start, we will have a QR code on the screen for you to scan to give your feedback on the session. Um, as an introduction, you know, I think we've heard the journey to achieving UHC is a significant component of our 2030 sustainable goals. And, you know, it really merits our attention and participation as key stakeholders. You know, we've seen the journey is not easy, as we have heard, uh, but we're taking steps in the right direction. Uh, this as Samantha has mentioned, is the first session we are hosting in the build-up to a Pan-African Social Security Conference that will be held on May 10th to 12th the next year, uh, where we look to bring together our expertise on the work we've done with the various social health insurance across the continent, as well as the pension, uh, social pension schemes that we've worked with across the continent. I'd like to thank Dr. Wang Yep, from Ministry of Health, for joining us today, as well as Mr. Kariuki from NHF for joining us today. And we hope you guys had a, a good time and have been able to take away something uh, relevant today. Thank you. Yes, everyone can rush to their next morning meetings.